Good evening. Well, I, I was just talking to Dr. Rick Taylor about whether if I said shh again for the 12th or 13th year in a row, whether that was getting old. But look, just <laughs> so shh, um, but you're all shushing. That's very nice. Um, welcome to the 22nd Annual Literary Lions Gala. I'm Nancy Pearl, and I'm del <laughs> Ah, shucks. <laughs> um, and I am delighted that you're here this evening to celebrate libraries and writers and honor tonight's Literary Lions of the King County Library System Foundation. So let's begin this evening. It's really interesting. There's a jumbotron, as you see right over there. But from this angle, all you see is this big pillar. <laughs> so you can see a little bit. OK. Um, let's begin by thanking our generous bestseller sponsor, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. and our starred review sponsors, Bellevue and Dodontic Associates, the Boeing, the, the Boeing Company, Car Carrie Glover and Thad Alston, <laughs> Pam Martin and Robert Livingston, Kim and Eric Moen, <laughs> Puget Sound Energy, yes, energy, that's what we need. Michelle and Ian Rubish, and Berta Seltzer. Additionally, we'd like to thank all of our sponsored our sponsors featured on the screen and in your programs. Let's give them a big round of applause, too. And of course, we want to thank our 16 literary lions in attendance this evening. Many of you here tonight are aspiring or published authors, and we're so blessed to live in a region that celebrates the written word and supports storytelling in all forms. This year's honorees are a remarkable group whose works transport us from our hectic lives, or they transport us into more hectic lives, and just for a moment allow us to focus on something wonderful or scary and different or the same but not the same from our day-to-day -day routines. Our literary lions have given true tales of the unlikeliest of triumphs, novels with protagonists gone wild, scary and creepy books. You know who you are, Kevin O'Brien. <laughs> and tender moments like what happens when a mouse and a bear visit the library. Don't clap, let's wait, please. It's my pleasure to welcome the 2015 Literary Lions onto the stage to join me. So, I have to say this every year too, and nobody ever listens, but please hold your applause until all of our honorees are up on the stage with me. Alphabetically, Bonnie Becker, and her new book is A, Liter A Library Book for Bear. Bonnie, where are you? Amanda Bevel and Julie Kramus Hearn, World Spice at Home. Daniel James Brown, The Boys in the Boat. What did I say? 
Uh, yeah, why don't you do that? And then, but some people will come this way. Um, Jamie Ford, Songs of Willow Frost. Kristen Hanna, The Nightingale. Smith Henderson, Fourth of July Creek. Patrick Jennings, Odd, Weird, and Little. Jim Lynch, Truth Like the Sun. Do I need to speak to that table? Do I need to get down from this podium and go down there? Philip Margolin, Woman with a Gun. Kevin O'Brien, Tell Me You're Sorry. Dan Richards, The Problem with Not Being Scared of Monsters. David Schaefer, who's come from Portland, Whiskey, Tango, Foxtrot. Garth Stein, A Sudden Light. And Sean Vestal, God Forsaken, Idaho. Yes, now you can play. This year, we have a special added presentation. Like the author standing with me now, J.A. Jantz makes her home here in the Pacific Northwest. With her latest book, Cold Betrayal, may I call you Judy? <laughs> Judy has published an impressive 53 books. By any measure, Judy is an established author and dedicated to her craft. She is well known to those of us in the Puget Sound and, she and her fans are around the globe. But what many may not know is Judy Jantz is also a generous philanthropist. She has helped secure more than $250,000 for local nonprofits, including the King County Library System Foundation. Since 2010, Judy and her husband, Bill, have hosted an author salon in their home, treating more than 100 guests to wonderful meals, private tours of their lovely garden, and the opportunity to meet their four-legged family member, a dachshund named Bella. And they are opening their home again this year, hosting another author salon on July 12th, which, if history holds promise which, if history holds, comma, promises to be a spectacular summer evening. Tickets can be purchased tonight right outside. And, and I said right outside because I never quite know how to pronounce F-O-Y-E-R, foyer, I guess. But, but before you rush out to claim your seat at a salon, please join me in welcoming J.A. Jantz to the stage. where I'm going to give her the King County Library System Literary Lions Award. Please, now let's. Now, what all the, Ju Judy, don't get off yet. What all, let's all the authors get together, please, for a picture. Okay. I'll be in the middle, in the back. I'm tall. <laughs> you are tall. Turn to our seats and let you enjoy your meals. So I invite you 
all to chat with your table mates about the best book you read in the last year. Enjoy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I will call Nancy Pearl up here if I have to. Thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying your dinner. And please do continue uh, eating as we move along with the rest of our program. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Gary Wasden and I'm the library director for the King County Library System. Thank you. And I apologize for how I look on these jumbo screens. <laughs> I assure you it's better if you look here at me and not at the screens. A little of me goes a long ways. Um, so before we go any further, I want to thank uh, all of you, of course, for being here and supporting the KCLF, KCLS Foundation. But a very special thanks to Rick Taylor, president of the KCLS Foundation Board. Thank you, Rick. And I'd also la like to ask you to join me in thanking our event co-chairs, Michelle Rubesh and Sherry Weatherby, for their efforts tonight. Thank you both so much. What a great evening. You've, uh, you've worked so hard on this and wonderful to see it to come to such tremendous fruition. A record crowd here tonight uh, for our annual fundraiser. Over 650 people here. Thank you. It's a great night to celebrate libraries. And you know, that really, uh, that really shouldn't surprise me that we have such a big crowd because uh, people like you and, and the gifts and support that you give to KCLS are what make us one of the largest library systems and one of the busiest library systems uh, in the country. You see that map up on screen? It's big. So 1.3 million, a little over 1.3 million residents we have here uh, in our KCLS service area. Nearly 80% of them have a library card. That's pretty remarkable. That is pretty remarkable. And I guess probably more importantly, they use their library cards regularly. So I, I'm new here. Um, I celebrated my two month anniversary uh, this past week. And um, yeah, I'm shooting for three months. Um, <clears throat> and my first goal was to get out and visit all 48 of our libraries throughout the county uh, during that first month. Uh, it was quite a challenge. We have libraries from Enumclaw to Richmond Beach, North Bend to Vashon Island. Yay, shout out. Who was that for, Richmond Beach? Vashon, yay, Richmond Beach. Um, just such amazing spaces and such diverse communities. It, it was a real challenge to get out, but not only to see our libraries, but to really appreciate the unique communities that we serve. Um, and of course, to get to enjoy a little bit of our um, regional traffic. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of our libraries. I, I will not tell you a story about all 48. Um, although I could, um, but you know there there are special stories and special things that happen in each one. Um, I remember the afternoon I visited the Foster Library uh, in particular. Now, Foster um, Library serves a, a community that really needs its library, and you see that as you enter the library. It is packed with people, a diverse audience, every computer filled, every seat taken, people lined up to get in, borrowing materials, waiting for their turn on the computer, really using that library, a community that depends on its library. And very excitingly, we're building a new library in that area, the Tukwila Library will be replacing the Foster Library. So they'll soon have a great new library to serve that community. Now, very different from that, uh, the library that's closest to our home, the Sammamish Library, 
Very different. Um, it's a community that I think we could all agree is, is a little more fluent. And I think it's easy to think that communities like that probably don't need their library so much. Um, but let me tell you, uh, the first uh, visit we made there on a Saturday afternoon uh, to see the library and meet the staff it was about 11 o'clock, 11.30. It was packed. Every computer taken, every seat taken, the children's area overflowing with kids and families. There were lines at the information desk, lines at the circulation desk, and there was an e-book demo going on, and there was a line of people waiting to learn how to use their e-readers. The staff very politely told me they didn't have time to say hi to me and greet me. Um, so I left. <laughs> um, but what an amazing thing to see that uh, in every community, we really do have libraries that are used by the people there and needed by the people there. Uh, it truly is uh, a remarkable place. One of my um, personal favorite visits, though, uh, was the Skykomish Library. Now, a lot of people don't know we have a library uh, out in Skykomish. I know, isn't it the cutest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> It's only about 840 square feet, uh, and there's a little apartment above the library. Um, it, it's, it's just so special. And this is a small community. I think Skykomish, the population, is about 450, 470 people. It, what a vital part of the, the community this library is. I was there on delivery day when uh, we were delivering materials from you know, the other libraries that can come for people to borrow them. And it was like the Wells Fargo wagon to come into town. <laughs> People just lined up to come in and pick up their holds. People were calling, saying, is the delivery guy there yet? Is the delivery guy there yet? Um, three computers in there, each one busy and people waiting to use them. So again, even with such a small space, uh, a community that really needs their library. And it really is um, like stepping back in time there. You feel like you're at Petticoat Junction. <clears throat> So before coming here, just to, to let you get to know me a little bit better, um, I've been in Omaha, Nebraska for the last five years, where I was executive director of Omaha Public Library. Really? Seriously? <laughs> but anyway, um, well, we do have Warren Buffett there. So we, it's really weird. There's this like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates connection uh, going on in my life. But um, a, a tremendous experience there working uh, in a smaller community of about 500,000 people with 12 libraries. Uh, and prior to that, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, I worked for the New York Public Library uh, in New York City, um, where we, I don't even know how many people you serve in New York City, several millions of people, um, and 92 libraries. <laughs> so I've been at both ends, and I'm now kind of happily settled almost exactly in the middle uh, here at KCLS. But you know, in all of those experiences, I, I feel like I learned so much about um, uh, how libraries are respected and treated by their communities, how they're used, what people want, what they expect, uh, but also how to be a part of the community. And one of the great things I've learned here in King County since coming here is while we are big, if you look at the big picture, we really just are a collection of little small communities. And each one is unique, each one is different, each one is special, uh, and each library reflects that. So that truly has been great to get to know you and get to know your libraries. You know, people do love their libraries in a special way here in KCLS. As I said earlier, like 80%, almost 80% of our residents use their cards. On average, we sign up almost 6,000 new card holders every month. So a lot of babies being born, a lot of people moving into the area, like me and my partner. We, we added two uh, in January. Um, so people are still coming to us, still using libraries in cities like Kirkland, Bellevue and Redmond were their Fortune 500 companies, corporate campuses, and in communities like Fashion Island and Carnation, where residents have seen their communities grow and change dramatically. Um, our whole county really is changing dramatically. From 2000 to 2010, an 11% overall population growth. That's great, tremendous growth for, uh, given the economy that we're emerging from now. But in addition to that 11% growth, when you dig down deeper, our Hispanic and Latino population has grown 81% in this county. That is remarkable growth. Next year, it'll be 81.5% because my partner that I brought with me is also Latino. So, um, But those changes are reflected in our libraries, and we have to change with that. Uh, over the last year, we've really worked to improve access to our collections. Uh, for people of all backgrounds, as people look and demand culturally relevant services and resources. We have a full-time Spanish language service specialist position. 
to reach out and engage that growing number of Latino and Spanish speaking patrons. We're also proud to lead the nation in providing ebooks and online magazines for our patrons in every community. Now, ebooks, you know, sometimes people think that digital materials, digital resources, that's something that only people of affluence have the luxury uh, of access. But in reality, we find that kids, teens, and adults, even in the lower income brackets, are often relying on mobile devices as opposed to computers at home. And through those mobile devices in all parts of the county, they're able to access our growing ebook collection. In fact, if you looked at our ebook collection as its own separate branch library, it would easily be the busiest branch of all 48 libraries. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be working with a team of people in a community that really wants to invest in libraries to build and design great libraries and great solutions that ensure that every single person in King County has access to our services, resources, story times, classes for English language learners, and a multitude of other services that we offer each and every day throughout the county. Now last year, before I was here, uh, we invited you to support team programming at KCLS at this event, and you responded generously. Thanks to you, more than 12,000 teens received tutoring sessions in our study zone programs. Your generosity also helped more than 100 students prepare for college with free six-week SAT prep classes. Now, typically, the cost of these courses make them out of reach for low or no income students. However, your gifts made at last year's gala, KCLS offered SAT prep courses at 12 libraries. The students who finished those courses realized an increase in their test scores by an average of 149 points on their SATs. That's incredible. Thank you for that. And now I'd like to, to invite you to learn about one of our very special programs that KCLS is proud to, to present and deliver. So please help me welcome to the stage Senior Project Officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and member of the KCLS Foundation Council of Advisors, Jamie Horde, who will tell us more about the Let's Read program. Jamie? Thanks, Gary. Well, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here tonight with all of you. And I'm here to ask you to join me in supporting the King County Library System. Last year, we raised a tremendous amount. And with a sold out group tonight, I think we are poised to set a record for how much money we can raise for King County Library System. So let me share with you a little bit about why I give to libraries. So last year, when I was sitting where you're sitting, I was thinking about all the reasons why I value our public libraries. And one particular memory came to mind. I'd been driving around in the rain, and in the back seat of the car, I hear this question from my then four-year-old son. So mom, where, how, how do the babies get in the mom's tummy? Okay, my mind was racing. What is an age-appropriate response? So in a moment of parental wisdom, I said to him, you know, the next time we go to the library, let's ask the librarian. I bet they can give us some books that will answer all of your questions. For me, libraries are a lifeline. And if you ever have to answer questions for small children in your life, they might be a lifeline for you too. But for many families in King County, libraries are a lifeline. Especially as these summer months come up, you're thinking about how do I keep my child engaged and entertained and intellectually challenged and avoid that summer slide. So what's a summer slide? Well, many of you may think of it as the time you didn't have to go to school when you were in K through 12. It has real importance and relevance to kids that struggle through the summer. On average, during the summer recess, kids lose about two months of math skills. And low-income children lose an additional two months in reading achievement. This is in part because parents don't always have the time or resources to read to their children. It's also because they don't necessarily have the time or ability to take their child to the all-important library visit. As a child grows older, the achievement gap widens. 
And even if children from different income levels learn the same in the classroom, by the time a child from a lower income household reaches fifth grade, she will have experienced five summer slides. And that could be as many as two and a half years behind her classmates. Let's Read is a KCLS program that reaches kids who are falling behind. Let's Read is their lifeline. Done in partnership with other agencies, KCLS brings programming to parks, community centers, and even apartment complexes. And in conjunction with a free lunch to ensure that children won't miss out on those all important library visits. Let's Read introduces students who may be on free and reduced lunch during the school year to librarians, to science programs and educational events in venues that make it easy for parents and for caregivers or even older siblings. And every child leaves with a chance to get their own library card and a book for their home library. But rather than me telling you more about this program, I'm gonna borrow three minutes from my time with you and invite you to see the program's impact firsthand. So I just wanna know, is it we love or we like? We love. <laughs> Well, hearing them really makes me smile, and it makes me remember how much I enjoyed reading over the summer. And I know that you want to make sure that kids like Kina and Kashan and Diego, Alondra, some of the kids you saw on the video, have a chance to read this summer. So tonight, we have a goal. We want to raise $80,000 in this room. Now, before you write down that number that you had in your mind when you arrived tonight, let me tell you about a challenge match sponsored by generous group of foundation donors listed in your program, and soon to be on the screen, you have the opportunity to double your gift or pledge. Slimpy, make a gift of $300 or more, and it will be matched dollar for dollar. Every, ga every gift, oh yes, to our donors. Now, every gift counts but don't miss this opportunity to double your donation. For example, if you make a gift of $2,500, it magically becomes $5,000, and that's the cost of underwriting an entire Let's Read site and ensuring that 100 kids are able to enjoy library programming, a healthy meal, and leave with a book for their home library. If you make a gift of $500, it becomes 1000 and it buys books for 75 kids. You have a power to make a difference tonight. Please challenge yourself and help us leverage this matching gift. Now, I'll ask your table captains to please share the pledge cards you have, and I'll give you a moment to turn your attention to your contribution. Well, thank you for your attention and for giving as generously as you can Table captains, you can return your packet to registration before you leave tonight. And now, well, wait, let's do a applause for the table captains for carrying out those duties. And now I'll turn our program back to Nancy. Thank you, Jamie. Wait, I have to find where I'm supposed to be. So I too want to thank all of you who have made a donation tonight. And I want to tell you that um, as someone who, has, um, who grew up in an inner city neighborhood of Detroit and uh, didn't have money to buy books, uh, and the book my mother gave me was called From Egg to Chick. So, so there was some clucking in our house. <laughs> um, you know, libraries, libraries are, are, are so important. I mean, libraries are the center of the community, the heart of the community. And I always feel that anything we can do to support them is worth doing. So thank you for your contributions tonight. Um, let's see, for those of you who are basketball fans, 
No, no. No, they play tomorrow. Gonzaga plays tomorrow. All right, okay. I thought you'd want to know, so I'm going to leave it up there. Um, will you cover your ears? Do you want to cover your ears? Okay, I'm going to tell you and cover your ears if you don't want to hear. <laughs> oh, crumb. All right, forget it. Now it's time to introduce my friend, Ann Patchett. And I don't think she doesn't care about basketball, so she can choose to say who won or not. What? Who's playing? The University of Kentucky versus Notre Dame. I first met Ann Patchett in 2008 when I interviewed her for my TV show on the Seattle Channel. You can still watch that interview on your computer, which I did recently. She was on tour then in Seattle with her newest novel at the time, Run. I sometimes find that meeting authors whose books I've loved can be um, a bit disillusioning because sometimes he or she is somewhat different from how I've pictured her or him. But Anne was absolutely lovely, and after the interview, I think we both felt that we could be friends. But then she went back to her home in Nashville, and I went on with my life here, and we didn't follow through. Then last year, I interviewed Anne in front of um, an audience, a large audience actually, at Town Hall, and that cemented our friendship. Many of you probably know Anne as the author of Bel Canto, which is indeed a wonderful, wonderful novel. But you might not know that the Lyric Opera of Chicago is premiering an opera based on that novel. I would also going back to the literary rather than the musical, I would urge you, if you have not read the three novels that appeared before Bel Canto, catapulted Anne into the top of the literary world, um, I first discovered her books with her very first novel, The Patron Saint of Liars, way back in 1992 when I was working as a librarian in Tulsa. And as I'm sure that many of you do, when I discover a writer whose books I love right at the beginning of her career, I just wait so impatiently for the next one and the one after that. And with Anne, I never lost my initial enthusiasm for her wonderful, wonderful writing and her ability to create three-dimensional and interesting characters. I'm equally delighted with her nonfiction including her memoir, Truth and Beauty, about her deep friendship with poet Lucy Greeley, and her most recent book, a wonderful collection of essays called This is the Story of a Happy Marriage. And some of you here tonight might not know that when the last bookstore in Nashville closed, Anne began, founded, opened a bookstore called Parnassus Books. And the title... The title comes from Christopher Morley's very funny novel of a traveling bookstore, Parnassus on Wheels, which I also recommend. Anne has a wonderful sense of humor, and she's wicked, wicked smart. To quote Wilbur, the hero of E.B. White's Charlotte's Web, it is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Anne is both. Join me in welcoming. There are a couple of things I want to say. Nancy, thank you. I've been in love with her for such a long time. Um, and it's really fun that we finally get to be friends. And you're so lucky to have her in your town. There are a couple of, yes. 
Um, there are a couple of total non sequitur things that I want to say before I get into my talk. One is I don't want anyone here to be afraid because I know what time it is and my great virtue as a public speaker is I never go on too long. So I don't want you to have that, yay! I don't want you to have that panicky feeling that one can have for the after dinner speaker takes the stage. I'm excited that there are so many great writers here tonight and it makes me want to get up and go around and meet everybody. But I, I don't know where David Schaefer is, um, but I have to say to you, where, hey, hi, hi. So I want to say, I loved your book. I loved your book. And I loved a lot of the books of the people who came tonight, but you've had this big impact on my life and my marriage. Uh, David's book is called Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, which is a terrific book if you haven't read it. And my husband, Carl, is a really nice guy, and he's from Mississippi, and he doesn't swear sort of like part of his thing. And so now when anything happens in his life, when he drops a dish, when a patient comes in and wants to be seen at eight o'clock at night, and he calls me, he's like, whiskey fango, tango foxtrot. He says this all the time now. And it's, it's become our code. So you're very much a part of our life. Um, I just wanted to let you know that in case I couldn't find you in the crush afterwards that I could tell you that from the stage. Um, I always want to speak with a handheld mic and not stand behind the podium because I want you to enjoy my fabulous dress. Um, and I want to tell you that um, Liz Gilbert gave me this dress. Liz Gilbert went on tour with Oprah this year and they did eight events, eight different cities. And Liz, being Liz, ordered eight Oscar de la Renta dresses, one for every city of the Oprah tour, and one came in, and it wasn't her size. And so she sent it to me, uh, which was really nice, especially after I explained to her that, in fact, you can mail these dresses back, and they'll send you the correct size. She said, oh, I thought it would be cute on you. And then she bought this dress again in her size. So when her book comes out in September, a terrific book about creativity called Big Magic, we're gonna have an event at Parnassus in Nashville and we're both gonna wear this dress. <laughs> so I want you to just kind of be up on all of that. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about tonight in your after dinner library gala speech is altruism. Uh, which is something that I have been thinking about for a while. My friend Madison Smart Bell, who's a novelist, emailed me one day and he said he had a question about altruism. And he said, do you think it is possible for a person to truly be good? Does anybody ever do a good deed for the sake of goodness uh, without any expectation of reward? Or is it that the po those of us who do good deeds kind of get off on our good deeds in some way. So basically, Mother Teresa just really enjoyed lepers. And it means that her good deeds weren't really good because she was getting pleasure out of her good deeds. Now, I am the kind of person that people call when they have these questions because I went to Catholic school for 12 years. <laughs> and my answer was it doesn't make any difference at all if you get some sort of benefit from your altruistic good deed. If somebody is cold and you give them a blanket and it makes you feel good about yourself that you've given them a blanket, it doesn't make any difference. What matters is that that person is warm. They have a blanket. I checked this out with my nun. I actually have my own personal nun. That's not even a joke. Um, Sister Nina is mine. She is my responsibility in this world. If you read, this is the story of a happy marriage. The very last essay in the book is called The Mercies and it's about Sister Nina. She's 83. She taught me how to read when I was in first grade and we found each other later in life. And anyway, so I called Nina and I said, so, you know, what's the deal? Uh, she has not been reading a lot of Christopher Hitchens. Madison Smart Bell has been reading a lot of Christopher Hitchens. I said, so is there such a thing really as a good deed? Is there such a thing as altruism? Or if you enjoy it, does that sort of negate the value? I don't know how many of you grew up Catholic, but I really did grow up with the belief that if you did something good and you ever told anybody, 
completely wiped it off the slate. Like you were getting your reward now, you wouldn't be getting, are you Catholic? You're just nodding at me with this total like, yes, yes. So Sister Nina says, that's ridiculous. Of course a good deed is a good deed. It doesn't make any difference. You should feel good about it. You should have some sense of personal reward or benefit. I, I actually became really good friends uh, with the 1980s, 90s, super, super, super duper model, Paulina Poroskova. Do you remember Paulina Poroskova? Like, Paulina and I hang out now. And she was saying the same thing to me a week ago. She said, there is no such thing as a good deed. There's no such thing as a good person because we all get our rewards. All right. She said, you know, I live in New York. I go to all of these society things and every person who gives a blanket to a homeless person has a news crew behind them, you know, getting the photo footage and all of that. So put all of that in your mind. And now I'm gonna tell you about my good deed and about my altruism, which is this. In, oh, in early 2011, in Nashville, we lost our two bookstores. We had a Borders, which was 30,000 square feet, and we had a store called Davis Kid. Davis Kid used to be our locally owned and operated independent bookseller. Wow, that was a lot closer than I thought. Um, <laughs> and it was bought by a chain out of Ohio called Joseph Beth Booksellers, and it also became a 30,000 square foot bookstore. So we've got two bookstores in Nashville, and they're both the size of Macy's. And in 2011, they both closed. Now, Borders, we know, went the way of all Borders. And Davis Kidd closed, as we say, at a corporate level, which means that even though the store was profitable, the Joseph Beth chain had 10 stores, and it wasn't sustainable, and so they closed eight of them. So everybody in Nashville, you know, we were rending our garments, we were pounding our heads, we were weeping. We had no bookstore. We had some good used bookstores, but let me tell you, I'm in the business of selling books for a living and used bookstores mean nothing to me. <laughs> and so I kept thinking, all right, they're gonna open a bookstore, right? Somebody's gonna open a bookstore. And I waited and I waited and they were having committee meetings and I wanna go into retail about as much as I wanna go into the army. I mean, this is not my dream to go into retail, but I'm thinking someone's gonna do it, someone's gonna step up. And I start thinking, well, God, whose responsibility is this? Whose responsibility is this to open a bookstore, right? It's gotta be, and then I stop. And I think, and I'm thinking of Sister Nina, and I'm thinking of the Mercy nuns who raised me. And what the nuns always told us was this, if you can formulate the sentence in your mind, whose responsibility is it to? Whose responsibility is it to pick up the trash? Whose responsibility is it to reform public education? Whose responsibility is it to support our library system? Well, it's yours. As soon as you can figure out that sentence, it is your responsibility. All right, short segue, true story. Uh, when I was in college, I went to summer school at Harvard. Now, we all know that Harvard is a wonderful, venerable, hallowed hall of learning. What you might not know is Harvard has one of the worst cockroach problems of any university in this country. Outrageous insects. So that summer, I am rooming in a suite with three friends and we've got roaches. I mean, there's just, there's just no way, there's no way to even explain it. They ran across the floors at night. Every time we would come in and flick the light on, it was like they were playing canasta and smoking, and they were like, yeah, you what? Uh, and we would scream and run around. So one night, in the middle of the night, I get up, it's probably 11 o'clock at night, and I get out of bed, and I step on a cockroach. And I mean, I don't put a dent in this thing. I don't harm it, not one of its legs. 
it just shoots right on out. And I scream, and the other three girls scream, and we get up, and we've got towels, and we're running around, we're running around. We finally, we get the cockroach into the bathroom and into the shower, and we're, we slam the door, and we roll the towel, and we shove the towel under the door, and we're doing that thing that girls do when they get upset. We're hopping. <laughs> and we're like, God, and I said, and we're, we're, you know, we're teary. We're so, I said, I'm gonna go get security. <laughs> so I go downstairs and, and I find a security guard and he's like 87. <laughs> and I said, you've got to come up to the room. We've got, I got a bug. And he's like, okay, all right. So he comes upstairs and we're all standing behind him and we're hopping. And he, he goes in, takes the towel out, and he looks in the shower. And he turns around and he looks at us. And he said a sentence, and I'm not even joking, that changed my life forever. He says, ladies, you are on your own. <laughs> and I knew he wasn't talking to the three of them. He was talking to me. And I took my shoe off and I did what had to be done. And that's what it was like to open a bookstore. And I thought, you know, I love my city. I love Nashville. I don't wanna live in a city that doesn't have a bookstore. I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna lose my shirt, I'm gonna spend a bunch of money because this is right. This is like your symphony is going down the drain and you've gotta have a symphony. I'm gonna step in and I'm gonna do what's right. In April of 2011, I was introduced to a woman named Karen Hayes and we had lunch. And over the course of lunch, we decided to open a bookstore together. That was, that was how well we knew each other, one lunch. And this was the last day, it was April 30th. We opened the store on November 15th. There was not a lot of thought going into this process. It was like it was happening, I needed it to be done, and I was altruistic. I was a good person. I was gonna come through and do the right thing for my city. And I never thought about what I would get out of it. Let me tell you what I got out of it. Well, the first thing is I got a dog named Sparky. Sparky works at that bookstore. I pull up in front of the bookstore, I call. I don't, I don't even go in, I just call on the phone. I say, come get the dog. And I roll down the window and one of the girls in the bookstore comes and she takes the dog out of the car and he plays in the store all day. Never has a dog been so happy as Sparky is. I would have built that store just for Sparky. Okay, number two. I live in Nashville, right? You know, the writers, they write songs. They don't write books. Now I get to see not only all of my friends, but all of the people I ever wanted to be friends with because everybody comes to Nashville because I am the mafia. And I know, if I don't know the writer, I know your publicist. I did a favor once for your editor. I can get you. I can make you come to Nashville. And so everybody I want to see I get to see my friend Liz Gilbert, I get to see her, Donna Tart. I get to see her, and also the people that I don't know, I will get to you sooner or later, and I'll get you to come to Nashville. So that was fantastic. Oh my God, and what do we sell at Parnassus Books? We sell my books all day long. I swear to you, I never even thought of that. So that's been really good. But the thing that I get to do, the thing that makes it true that this was not a good deed, that this was not an altruistic act, but this is what I'm getting out of it. I get to force strangers to read the books I want them to read. <laughs> Let's assume that everyone in this room is a reader. Let's assume that we are all here because we read, and we know as readers, it's a wonderful thing to find a book that we love but that experience is never fulfilled until you can turn around to your friend, your husband, your sister, your child, and say, oh my God, 
you've got to read this book. I mean, that's the covenant between the book and the reader, is to give it to the person and say, this is the book for you. It's matchmaking. And I've been forcing people I know to read the books I love my whole life, my family, my friends. Now I have a limitless audience. Other story. I was in graduate school at Iowa. This was, let's call it 1986. And I was in O'Hare, flying home. I had a really heavy bag. And, and in the airport, I got lost. Do you remember when you could get lost in an airport? Do you remember that? I mean, it's like, talk about, it's like, do you remember when you could smoke in an airport? You could smoke and get lost at the same time. And I was walking around O'Hare, looking around like this, and this guy comes up to me and he says, are you lost? And I said, yeah, I am, and he was cute. He looked like John Denver. You know, he had straight blonde hair and little round glasses and a pink polo shirt and khakis. He says, let me see your ticket. And I give him my ticket. And he says, man, you are lost. He said, you know what, I'll take you there. I'll carry your bag. And he takes my suitcase. And I'm, I wasn't that kind of girl, you know? So I'm pretty excited that this cute boy wants to walk me to the gate and carry my suitcase. And I said, well, what about you? I mean, I don't want to make you late for your flight. He says, no, I don't have a flight. I'm a Hare Krishna. <laughs> and I'm afraid. This breaks my heart. This is so touching. Do you remember when we were afraid of Hare Krishnas in the airport? Like a Hare Krishna in an airport was scary. God, bring back the Hare Krishnas. Oh, oh, how I miss them. I miss them. So we get to my gate and I'm saying, you don't have to walk me there. I'm, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I can get to my gate just fine. He says, no, 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 I can walk you there. So we get to my gate and my plane is two hours late. And the Hare Krishna says to me, I'll wait with you. <laughs> okay. And the Hare Krishna says to me, imagine that you love God so much that you would stand in an airport all day because you want to tell them that this love that fills you, this love that is the greatest thing you have ever known, it's so enormous. You want to give it to strangers who are terrified of you, who are hiding behind their Time magazines, who are running past you. That is how I feel about books. That's what it's like for me to go into Parnassus books and say to someone, the new Abigail Thomas book just came out. What comes next and how to like it? You need to buy this book. I can put books in people's hands and people in Nashville are afraid of me. I'm a very powerful person. And no matter what I hand them, they take it and they go home and they read it, and it is such an incredible joy. I would have started a bookstore for that if I had had any idea. Let me just tell you, Hector Tobar's Deep Down Dark was my favorite book of the year last year, and Sally Mann's got a book coming out next month called Hold Still. And every single person in this room must read Atul Gawande's Being Mortal, because every single one of us is going to die. I don't I hate to break that to you. Um, and when you finish reading Being Mortal, read Roz Chastis. Can't we please talk about something more pleasant? <laughs> Kelly Link's short stories, Get in Trouble. I can do this all night long. Richard Price, do you guys like Richard Price? His new book, The Whites, he wrote Clockers and Freedom Land. It is so exciting to me to match up people with the book and to be that person in my community. All my life, not all my life, all my grown-up professional life. I have people coming up to me in the grocery store and they say, I love bel canto. And because I went to Catholic school, everything in me steps backwards. I, can, I now know not to step too far backwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm not so good with that. I love bel canto. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just go get some cheese. But now I'm in the bookstore, I'm in the grocery store, and people come up to me and they say, I love Parnassus books. I love the bookstore. And for that, I can totally step forward and I say, I love the bookstore too. What are you reading? What are you reading right now? I'm reading The Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, which I should have read 10 years ago, but it's really hard and I was kind of afraid of it. It's a brilliant book. Now, we know, we in Seattle, especially know, there are a lot of different ways to get books. And all of those ways are good. Because what I care about is not how you read, but that you read. Now, I also want to say, maybe you like to have your books come to your home. And that's a great thing. But you still have a sense of your community. And your community still needs things that you might not personally be into. It needs small businesses, and it needs little bookstores, and it needs a symphony, even if the symphony's not your thing. And it needs a library, because we all need to read, and we all are going to get our books in different ways. So even if the people in this room don't shop at an independent bookstore and you get your books in different ways, and that's fine. You probably understand that every now and then you need to go out and support your independent bookstore because you want to have a certain kind of community where you have small businesses and you have that place where you can take your family and you got the kids' story hours and all of those different things. And you probably, all the people in this room, I'm going to just whack this for Scythia until I kill it. Um, all the people in this room probably don't need to use your public library. I bet every person here can afford to buy a book. And maybe the library isn't really on your circuit. But you know what? You understand that your community needs a lot of different ways for people to get books. Because for so many of us, reading is the way it is for me, which is the huge life-changing event, the great, great marriage, the great meeting of the minds that come through books. So you know that even though you personally don't need to use your public library, you want to live in a city, in a county, in a state, in a country, in a world in which people have full access to information and they can get whatever books they want. I have been on the foundation board of my public library for 10 years. They wear me out. <laughs> they use me constantly. And I'm so proud to be a part of that organization and to make sure that everybody can get the books. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the library is the place where our government shines its very brightest. Because I don't actually, yay. Um, I don't believe that we are all equal in front of the law. And even though we're trying really hard, we don't receive equal education and we don't receive equal health care. But by God, you want any book that's out there and the library system of King County will get it for you just the way they would get it for you if you were at Harvard with the cockroaches going into Widener. They're gonna get you any book you want, even if it's in that little tiny, adorable little house on the prairie library that we saw earlier. <laughs> so here's the thing. I don't care what your motives are. I don't care if you have a bright and shining heart of altruism or that you want to make sure that you have a good society because you know the correlation between early literacy and crime. If we have a society that reads, that can participate in all forms of information, we have a better, safer, happier society. 
it's good for all of us. So that's what we will invest in tonight. Tonight. Um, besides, you're just so lucky. You get to live in this beautiful, beautiful place. Go into your heart. Express your joy at your good fortune by protecting and supporting your greatest gift that you may never have to use, the public library system. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and let me just say in closing, if you don't know who won that basketball game, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> good night. Thank you, Anne. Before you head out, I want to remind you that if you want to have um, some time with an author, as we just did with Anne, where you can get up close and personal with um, one of your favorite authors, please visit the author salon table in the foyer. There are several salons which still have room, and we'd love for you to join us. So take a look at um, the salons offered by Ruth Ozeki and Miru Dalwala. She's one of my, she is another one of my favorite uh, people. Ruth Ozeki is just a super nice person. Um, Maxim Belay, who's here tonight, has offered to do, is going to do a salon. Um, Timothy Shaffert is going to do a salon with um, the new director at King County, Gary Wasden. And I just want to say, um, if you're looking for a new author to read, if you haven't read anything by Timothy Shaffert, he's one of my favorite writers, and he has a new book out called The Swan Gondola. But the one that I really would suggest that you pick up and read because it's a delight is called The Coffins of Little Hope. And uh, it's just as good as the title. It's just great. So once again, thank you for coming this evening. Please join me and the Literary Lions out in the uh, foyer. I learned how to pronounce that. For some more book signing, I hope that uh, 2015 is a great reading year. And we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.